G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I want to talk about the Hawthorne Football Club and their meteoric rise into what is only 8th position at the moment, but this has felt like a long time coming. Um, they have been one of the form sides of the competition since about round 5, or they 0-5 this season. And, you know, just the eye test, watching Hawthorne and the way they can dismantle certain clubs has been startling. They've been a huge narrative out of season 2024 in a year that has had a lot of narratives. It's been a whack season, to be honest. So, you know, now that they've dismantled Carlton, who obviously dealing with some injuries, I thought this would be a good time to look at Hawthorne. This has been a long time coming making this video. And I decided to have a little gander last night, specifically at how they've built this team to be so good so quickly. And the results have been startling. The results have been startling. I'm particularly taking a look at how they've built this best 22 in this team. And I think this video has the potential to really challenge some preconceived notions we have, not only about the Hawthorne Football Club and, and how they've risen up, but also just about list management in general. These notions we have about rebuilding lists and what it takes to get your club good again after a period of a lack of success. So just skimming off the top of you know some context with Hawthorne, obviously three peat side, that probably ended, that era ended when they were knocked out by the Western Bulldogs in 2016. A little bit of a dead cat bounce. Tried to rejig their best 22. Big trades for Tom Mitchell, Jagger Amira, some of the hottest talents in the league at that time that ultimately fell short. They offloaded those players at a later date. They fell out of relevance for a little while there. Not really making finals much in the last, I don't know, six years. They missed in 17, top four in 18. Don't think they've made the finals since then. At times, you know, even at the start of this year and certainly for the first portion of last year, look like cellar dwellers. And now they're back. And the interesting conclusion I've made from doing this analysis, which has been somewhat superficial, but nonetheless, I think very telling, has been the fact that Hawthorne's bounced back into being the team that they currently are, which is, I think, a team that will play finals this year and potentially win one and, you know, really look like they're on an upward trajectory to being a premiership contender before too long. The conclusion I've made from this is that it has almost nothing to do with the fact that they fell out of finals for a number of years and had access to early draft picks. Almost nothing to do with it. So let's be specific about this and I'll get into how they've built their best 22. And I've looked at specifically the 22 that played against Carlton and added a few extra pieces to this puzzle to add some context. We're going to talk about 24, 25 players here. But before I do that, bit of a stats profile on Hawthorne. If you didn't already know that, they're going pretty well this year. But it's interesting to look at how they're going well, okay? So we know that they're the number one ground ball differential side. Almost historically, I think they were top six at some point. Historically, um, you know, that was a stat that was given to us by Daniel Hoyne when Hawthorne were going poorly. They are still number one in the league for ground ball differential. It's also interesting to note, top three over the course of the season, which includes their poor start to the year in hardball gets differential and also number one in loose ball gets differential. So the balance between contested and uncontested is really strong. Top five in handball receives where they're a relatively handball happy team and they're actually bottom four for kick to handball ratio. That's if you look at a higher kick to ratio percentage as better. They tend to handball more than they kick. Top three in intercept possession differential, top three in contested ball general, top five in inside 50 differential and top six in tackle inside 50 differential. So what does that tell us? Handball happy side, also top three in disposal efficiency. So they hit their targets. They win the ball in dispute. They're just generally well-rounded in a team that is comprised of, you know, I would probably say a lack of genuine star A-grade talent. Of course, there is a number of them on that team, but you know what I mean. There's no one really challenging for the Brownlow this year. No one challenging for the Coleman. The usual pieces of a premiership puzzle or a finals quality side don't appear to be there on the surface with Hawthorne, but let's talk about this team. So it's also worth noting age stats. Fourth youngest selected team this year. So at the start of the year, the AFL releases their um, their list averages, right? Which is one piece of the puzzle, but we're talking about the actual teams that have been selected this year are far more telling. So Hawthorne have been the fourth youngest this year and the fifth least experienced. Now let's go through how they've built this team. And this is fascinating. Let's start with the actual high draft picks that they've taken, you know, since they tumbled down the ladder, since the three-peat. This is a list of them here. I've ordered it in, you know, quality of pick, how high the pick was. So Nick Watson in pick five last year, Denver Granger, Barras, Cam McKenzie, Josh Ward, Will Day, Josh Weddle, and Will McCabe. I'll also tack on Connor McDonald at the end of this. He was pick 26. He was the only player um, taken in the second round in their entire team. So I thought I'd include him in this, and he is a gun player. But if you look at that, 
particularly looking at the top 20 selections. How many of those are actually having a big impact on how Hawthorne's going right now? I will say Will Day, absolutely one of their best players and shouldn't be ignored. But he was taken in pick 13 in 2019. Where did Hawthorne finish in 2019? They finished ninth. So not anywhere near really bottoming out at that point. My memory of that draft is Hawthorne kind of plucked him. They kind of reached for him. He was a genuine draft bolter. And this speaks to this idea that Hawthorne have this philosophy of just picking their guys. And this is further evidenced by Josh Weddle. Josh Weddle's having a fantastic season. Is he a genuine, like in isolation, a genuine playmaker that is the reason they've come good? Probably not, but there's probably, you know, a handful of players that can really say that they're doing that. He's an important piece of the puzzle, so we'll We'll pay it as a great selection here. They also traded for him. They live traded for Josh Weddle, and he was another reach. So another example of Hawthorne just picking the guy that they think is going to be good. And with Will Day and Josh Weddle, they absolutely struck gold. Nick Watson was more or less the pick that was expected to some extent. He was a top five talent. They took him with pick five, had a great debut season. But other that's outside of that top three, those are the rebuild picks, if you want. The relatively high draft picks. Denver Granger Barras, you know, I think is struggling at that club. Cam McKenzie, Josh Ward look decent, but they're not really having a big impact on where they're at now, and that's important. Connor McDonald is a good player, an important piece of the puzzle. But as far as the team goes, that's not a very large percentage of what's driving their improvement. So let's go through how Hawthorne have built their list with late picks. This is where it gets fascinating. So this is largely looking at the team that was selected um, to play Carlton on the weekend, bearing in mind I've probably added one or two injured players that are that's still part of this analysis. So James Sicily was taken at 56 in 2013 and Bruce was a rookie pick in 2008. Those are more retrospective examples, but a lot of these are modern. A lot of these were taken since Hawthorne dropped out of flag contention. Dylan Moore at pick 67. Jai Newcomb was a mid-season draft pick. James Warple can be a great player when he's you know, really informed. Pick 45. Blake Hardwick, an absolute gun. Pick 44. Mitch Lewis, injured, hasn't had the best run of luck lately, or in general, to be honest. But I would still say an important part of their team going forward, albeit not really a big part of what's made them good lately, but still great selection. Giath, Cat B rookie 2018. Connor Nash, Cat B rookie from Dublin. Cole Shadir, one of those afterthought father-son picks right at the end of the draft. You know, again, not in isolation, making a big impact on them, but another guy who looks absolutely the great at AFL level. Then it's Harry Morrison, who's played eight games this year, who was selected on the wing to play against Hawthorne, pick 74. Look at that strike rate. Look at that strike rate. Then let's talk about the other ways they've added to the list. And we'll talk about the players that they've traded in in recent times. Now, Massimo D'Ambrosio is a classic example. Traded for what I think is roughly a third and fourth. It's not really important what exactly he was traded for. But pretty much an afterthought trade. Will he get a game at Hawthorne? Was struggling to get a game at Essendon. If you're Essendon right now, rather than this isn't intended as a pot shot at Essendon, but you've got to look at what's happened at Massimo D'Ambrosio playing legitimately on a wing at Hawthorne this year and thinking... Why is it that we were unable to get that player to be a gun? Now, again, that's not a massive shot at Essendon. There's probably a lot of clubs that D'Ambrosio might have been playing at and weren't, wasn't reaching his potential. But, geez, if that isn't a telling story, an informative story about what can happen with these role players that are on the fringes of your best 22, well, then I don't know what is. Let's talk about Jack Ginevan, premiership player, traded for a future second. Uh, Lloyd Meek. Steak Knives, part of the Jager O'Meara deal that joined Fremantle. It was Meek and a future second for Jager O'Meara. Sam Frost, obviously probably a little bit more of a journeyman player, still in their best 22, swaps of picks in the 40s, 50s, and 60s with Melbourne some time ago. Regardless, a cheap trade that has been, you know, he's been pretty important for them this year considering their injuries. Jack Gunston, this is going way back. So I'm not referring to the Brisbane trade last year. Obviously, there was a sensitive situation with his father. He's back. But back in the day, he was traded for a second, third, and fourth or something like that from Adelaide. Mabio Chol was traded for a future second. Jack Scrimshaw, top seven pick a number of years ago. Benefited a little bit from Gold Coast doing Gold Coast things. He and a fourth rounder made their way to Hawthorne for a third rounder. They signed Carl Amon for the free agent, so they also traded in Jarman Impey with pick 33. So look at that. Like, they've given up nothing for a lot of those players. And okay, Gunston's an obvious one, premiership player, probably not super part of this particular analysis. We're talking about how they got good again. Still an important player that has been a good veteran and a good leader over the stretch. Gidevin's having a great year. Lloyd Meek is one of the breakout players of this year, as is D'Ambrosio. Scrimshaw, Amon, Impey, Mabiotrol, all best 22 players. 
All of this is done through shrewd trading and talent identification and an ability to look at players who fit a system and fit well into it. So that is a massive information dump on how Hawthorne have built this current team and this is largely comprised of players that are really driving their improvement. There's a handful of standouts, there's a lot of role players, a lot of quality players in the positions that they play. And like I said, the only logical conclusion here is that Hawthorne's resurgence has almost nothing to do with their access to the first round of drafts. And it challenges this belief that we have in the AFL space where we look at clubs who are bottoming out and thinking, oh, they probably haven't bottomed out enough. You know, you've got years to access the draft before you can bounce up again. We've got Tasmania around the corner. I'm not invalidating that viewpoint at all. I do think that premiership sides do need to be built on an elite nucleus of players. If you look at a lot of, you know, the Geelong uh, dynasty back in the day, Hawthorne, Richmond, those are the three, right? We're a little bit removed from Brisbane and I was a bit young for that. Although the same still applied. They had a core nucleus of players that they added to it with later picks. So look at Richmond. I think they had one of their rookie drafts. It might have been 2016. They added four premiership players from the rookie draft alone. Now that was built around a team of amazing players. Alex Rance, Dustin Martin, Jack Rewalt, Trent Koch, and the list goes on. That's, that's a really good, strong core. Hawthorne had... Buddy, Roughhead, Hodge, Lewis, Mitchell. And I realize we're not there yet with Hawthorne. I'm not saying that Hawthorne is going to be a dynasty team again. It does need to be centered around a group of elite players. And that may or may not come from this group. It's a little bit early to speak with certainty on that. But I think time and time again, you know, even looking at Geelong, who refreshed their list between 2011 to 2022, they had some high profile trades, no doubt, but there was also a lot of late selections that turned out to be gold. Look at Tom Stewart, Tyson Stengel, Ryan Myers, like the list goes on. So for my mind, it's not so much about simply accessing the early parts of drafts. It's the ability to work with what you got and make shrewd moves. And this Hawthorne list build is, is an outlier. Like this is outstanding. And there's obviously a lot of abstract things we can point to here. So look, Sam Mitchell is widely regarded as an amazing coach. And it's I'm not gonna argue against that. He's obviously a great coach. It's just hard to ascertain where does his brilliance start and end and where does this list identification, this talent identification, this recruitment, where does that end? Where exactly is the balance? We can't really speak with certainty on that. We just know that the mix seems to be working really well at Hawthorne. The benefits of this, of what Hawthorne's doing now, is also gonna compound. So we just talked about all the players they've traded in. A lot of these guys were looking for their second chance at AFL. Like Mario Chol was unwanted. Massimo D'Ambrosio was unwanted largely. Ginevan, that was an iffy one. Lloyd Meek wasn't getting an opportunity at Fremantle. But the compounding benefit that they now have is look at how many players Hawthorne are linked to this offseason. So they're obviously looking at the trade and free agency space to try and bolster their list. And that makes sense for where they're at. But I mean, Tom Barras, Harry Perriman, Josh Battle, Bailey Smith. Now Hawthorne have re-emerged as a side that teams want to play for. That's not just because they're Hawthorne with however many members they have, they get to play on the MCG quite a lot, Prow Club, lots of success. That is already an inherent advantage or benefit. It's an earned advantage that Hawthorne have to some extent. They didn't earn the right to play on the MCG, but the proud history, the history of success, that is earned. But that's not what helped them recruit these players. And now they're in a position where they're in the hunt for Bailey Smith. I do think he's probably gonna end up at Geelong, but specifically like Josh Battle and Tom Barris, now the allure of Hawthorne is so much stronger because they've built the foundation with their late talent recruiting, their talent identification, their culture. Again, super hard to quantify culture, but I think we can reasonably conclude the culture is pretty good at Hawthorne. So anyway, I guess to summarize what we've said in this ranting video is that I'm not gonna make the claim that it's not handy to have picks at the higher end. I mean, I'm a supporter club that recruited Harley Reid and Harley Reid is instantly made West Coast a better team. They still kind of suck, but you know, you can see the impact of one star player that everyone everyone could see how good Harley Reid was gonna be two years out for getting drafted. Some of the best talents at North, like Sheasel, probably should have gone pick one. Um, George Wardlaw, Zane Dersma, like these guys, Colby McKercher, these guys, they're great to have, they're great to have. But I, I suppose the example is, it probably challenges this notion that you need to finish that low to be able to access top end talent because Hawthorne are making everyone look silly. Like I said, some great selections. Will Day, they picked when they finished ninth. Josh Weddle, the rather absolute first round banger, was traded live for pick 18 with the Sydney Swans. So it had nothing to do with bottoming out. And then there's Nick Watson, who's probably the actual example of you know finishing bottom four, bottom five, whatever they finished. I think it was third last actually, and they got Nick Watson. But other than that, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that Hawthorne 
benefited at all from falling down the ladder. So I think this is an inspiring example potentially to, well, I mean, I look at clubs who can probably look at this. I mean, I think of St Kilda, Essendon and North Melbourne are three clubs that have probably tried to get big fish trades, you know, in the past and and ultimately lost out to a bigger contender. I think of, you know, uh, Dusty Martin, Jordan Dugowie, these players were linked to moves to some of these clubs and they eventually didn't get over the line. And the conclusion was, well, they don't have enough pulling power to get those players to those clubs when there's Collingwood, there's Richmond. But this is an inspiring example of what you can do with not that many assets. It's, it's about talent identification. It's also about identifying players that work well in a system. It's about getting the system right. High draft picks, they're a little bit overrated. And that's the conclusion I'm gonna take from this Hawthorne thing. Again, they're an outlier in many respects, but it's it's incredible to see what is possible and what they've been able to do with such limited access to the draft. So let me know in the comments, guys, what you think, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.